Hello, and welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in integrative and functional medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and with each episode, we dive into the heart of healing with innovators, leaders in the thought space, and medical experts of all types of topics. If you've been around a while, you know we talk about gut health, microbiome, anti-aging, hormones, and a slew of other topics. Today will be no different, and I'll introduce our expert in just a moment. Um, If you have been around a while, I hope you will click subscribe. I hope you'll share the episode, give us a rating wherever you listen. That helps us to reach more people. And if you haven't heard, our documentary, Dr. Patient, is now out, available for streaming at drpatientmovie.com. Please go there, check it out, share it, gift it, watch it. Um, I hope it will be inspiring. It's a real deep dive into my own journey of healing and that of some of my uh, patients who've really overcome some amazing obstacles. All right. So today I want to introduce my guest, Dr. Sabrina Solt. She's a naturopathic medical doctor in Uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. She's been practicing regenerative and anti-aging medicine since 2013. Over the years, she's mastered various treatment modalities such as prolotherapy, PRP, adipose and bone marrow derived stem cells, as well as birth tissue biologics such as amniotic allograft and exosomes. She's known for crafting comprehensive and custom tailored treatment plans for her patients, which include things like diet and lifestyle, nutritional supplements, bioidentical hormones, peptide therapies, and of course, regenerative injections. In her free time, she enjoys reading, traveling, and spending time with her husband and three children. Welcome, Dr. Soltz. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. Yeah, so um, I always like to start with kind of your story into naturopathic medicine and then maybe into the regenerative space. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got started? Sure. So I uh, I always kind of knew I wanted to be a doctor. When I was an undergrad, I had the pleasure of actually attending a presentation where they were teaching about naturopathic medicine. And it was like, well, this is obvious. Why wouldn't I want to help people heal at the root cause instead of just giving them medication? And after that, I kind of set my sights that that's what I was doing. Uh, fast forward to medical school. I kind of pursued a little, like various interests while I was there. And it really wasn't until I was on a rotation where I was uh, – introduced, we'll say to prolotherapy, there was a physician that I was shadowing and he would perform prolotherapy on patients. And there was one patient in particular that came in, had a shoulder issue and it was a rotator cuff injury. And this guy was basically trying to prevent having surgery and trying to get off of pain medications. I had the fortunate ability to be able to treat that patient. And over several sessions, we were able to help him achieve his goal of again, getting off the pain medications and not having to have surgery. And after that, I was like, man, I'm sold. You know, I was a former athlete. I did volleyball. I did soccer. I did fitness competitions. So my joints were hurting. I was like, dang, okay, so maybe I can actually fix some of my own issues here. And after that, it was just my passion. I started learning everything that I could about that, about, you know, musculoskeletal uh, pain patterns, examination, how to really work with the body to heal it. Because what I found the difference between, you know, my approach as a naturopathic doctor compared to some of your, you know, counterparts in the orthopedic space, they really wanted to medicate and surgically manipulate the body into submission. Whereas I was really coming at it from this point of, well, how can we actually support the body so it heals itself and we can actually get people the results that we're looking for and get longevity out of these joints and reverse a lot of these issues that people think are permanent, like arthritis and whatnot. So that's kind of my my origin story. Uh, How exciting. And I always love when you have a vested, like you as an athlete, you saw your own like, uh, you know, injuries and things and obviously the power. I couldn't agree more. I think some of these new technologies that we're using, I love exosomes, love PRP. Let's kind of define for the audience. Um, You started PRP and now you're doing stem cells and other regenerative therapies. But maybe for those who don't really know, um, uh, prolotherapy versus PRP versus stem cells, do you want to give some basic definitions there? Yes. So we can kind of go up the ladder. And, you know, I really like to kind of qualify them as the easiest way to understand it is you're going from like the weakest sort of treatment to the strongest sort of treatment. Um, And not to say that one of them is is weak, so so to speak, because you can apply these things. And in the right person, it can be the perfect amount of strength for what they need. But prolotherapy involves using a very mildly irritative solution that's also somewhat nutritive. 
and injecting it with a certain technique that actually produces more irritation at the area. So for the gentleman with the shoulder issue and the rotator cuff, we basically needled in a very particular way at where that rotator cuff was attaching to the shoulder to basically remind the body like, hey, there's still some damage here. You need to bring more blood and more resources and more healing factors to that area so that we can finally heal this thing that just didn't heal right in the first place. And so that's kind of where a lot of people I think got started in the regenerative medicine space. And then from there, we can graduate to something a little bit stronger, which is PRP. So PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma, and it's a product that we get from a patient's own blood. It is no more difficult than doing a simple blood draw, and oftentimes we don't even need a ton of blood. You know, most of the time, most treatments to do an area, we're looking at about a tenth of what you'd give in a blood donation. So relatively small, still plenty for us to work for. And PRP, you can put it pretty much anywhere. And I have, and people can use their imaginations for that. It is very safe, very well tolerated. And there are only a few things that would make somebody not a candidate for PRP. From there, of course, we can get even stronger and we get into the world of stem cells. I think this is a, where, you know, where a lot of people kind of get confused because there's so much misinformation and confusing information out there about, well, what stem cells are allowed in the United States? What's happening outside of the United States? Where can we get stem cells? What's even legal to do? Uh, and I'll speak from a position of what we can do clinically in the United States, because I think that's what matters. And I don't, of course, have all the details about what's going on in those out-of-state clinics, you know, out-of-the-country clinics, I should say. But in the United States, we can actually get stem cells from a person's own fat or a person's own bone marrow. These are very easy procedures done in the office without the use of any general anesthesia. And depending on what we're working on, we may favor one over the other, again, just depending on the situation. We can also get products from birth tissue, like we were kind of talking about, like the exosomes. People also use umbilical cord products, Wharton's jelly, uh, products from the amniotic tissue, the amniotic fluid. And these products can be pretty powerful, uh, but there is kind of a gray area as to whether or not these products actually contain live stem cells. There are some companies that will say that, but according to the FDA, they're very clear that none of these products should contain live stem cells and there shouldn't be the transfer of live cells from one person to the other. Um, and again, not to say they're bad products, they still work very well and they definitely produce healing in a lot of patients, but we really have to understand what's the nuance of how this one might be working and may something else be a better fit. And like you were saying, exosomes. Uh, I know you probably work a lot with us with exosomes if you're treating patients that are very inflamed because exosomes are fantastic at taking down inflammation. They can be a really great addition to a lot of, uh, a lot of other procedures, especially if somebody has a lot of pain going into it, it's an acute issue, or even for aesthetics, you can use exosomes as topical after certain facials, a kind of a wide range of applications for those. Gosh, I love that's so helpful because so many people are very confused about the differences. And I really like that you broke that down. My experience is PRP after my um, extractions of teeth and um, the cavitation surgeries that I've had with that. They put PRP. I healed so beautifully. It was my own platelets. And of course, that's one use that you maybe don't do in your practice, but the dentist that I work with do, the biological dentist. And then I love facial. Like I'm a really, I, I don't love the term anti aging because I want to age well, right? I'm not into a bunch of filters or Botox or any of that, but I am into how can I optimize my collagen production, my skin. And I feel like I have good skin for my age. And part of that is because I love microneedling with exosomes. Um, I actually have my own uh, microneedling pen. So I do it myself sometimes and I have exosomes. And what I found is just like the power, like literally I'll do very, very light little bits. It's just stimulating the tissue, throwing on those exosomes and the next day it's glowing. It doesn't even have a down day. It's amazing. I'm sure you've had that experience as well. A hundred percent. I like to call it like the magic eraser almost because yeah. people, you know, pe I think microneedling got really famous not too long ago when um, I think it was one of the Kardashians. She posted this picture of her face just so bloody after microneedling and it intrigued people. But people were like, well, how long is that downtime? Am I going to be Am I going to look like that all day? It's terrifying. It's scary. Is it painful? But with the exosomes, when we put those on during the microneedling magic eraser, the redness is almost not there. It's you, you heal very, very quickly love that as an option. And as I've studied, I am not an aesthetician. I'm a medical doctor, but I've talked to a lot of practitioners. And what I realized too, is you don't need to go so deep. These very light, gentle, gentle, the body can get that signal. Now, granted, if you have a scar or something like that, I actually played with exosomes on my wrist from my broken wrist and my scar there. So I did some of that microneedling and exosomes there, and it just, it's really a nice scar. So scarring is a whole different uh, issue. Now we digress a little bit, but I know the women listening are like, you know, how do you get great skin? You have great skin. 
hopefully um, I'll continue to have great skin as we age. Um, but let's go back to joints and things, because one of the questions I get a lot is low back pain, shoulder pain, knee pain. What is good indications? Because I think there's probably better indications for some of these and, and ones that maybe don't do quite as well. Would you maybe lay the land like things that you see very successful as far as the types of joints or situations and ones that are maybe a little bit less likely to have a good impact? Yeah. So there's kind of two components to this or two sides to this coin. And it's, well, what's actually happening with that joint or that body part itself? And then what human is that body part attached to? So we'll start, I'll start with the human part first, because of course there are factors that go into whether or not somebody is going to be a good candidate for these procedures. And there's very few things that would determine somebody to be a non-candidate. Uh, things like being a cigarette smoker, having active cancer, uh, BMI above 30, especially for for weight bearing joints simply because gravity has that impact on those joints and can, can further exacerbate those things and be on certain medications. Now, of course, some of those aren't permanent. You know, you, people can quit smoking, people can lose weight, people can get off medications. So we can definitely move them towards that. But active cancer is for sure something that we don't work with. And now, as long as a person is a great candidate and that can range from things, right? You don't have to be in perfect health. You don't have to be in perfect shape, but as long as you're generally eating a healthy diet, getting adequate sleep, doing enough movement to, you know, keep yourself healthy, active, managing stress, you're probably going to do pretty well with almost any type of regenerative injection. When it comes to the areas that we're treating, I do find that the most successful ones are ones that you can catch as early as possible. So if you've had back issues for 20, 30 years, yes, we can help, but it's probably not going to be to a perfect degree. And this is what I try to teach people too. When it comes to regenerative injections, it's never black or white. Did it work or did it not work? It usually falls on a spectrum. So did you get 80, 90% improvement, maybe even hundred? Perfect. That's obviously what we want to aim for. But a lot of the times somewhere people fall somewhere below. I usually don't see less than like a 30% improvement. Again, as long as a patient's a good candidate and whatnot, and they do follow post-care instructions, which are important. Um, we usually don't see less than that. So if somebody's going to be, you know, looking for that, say they've got a torn meniscus in the knee, for example, and they want to stay active and they can't because, you know, they play pickleball and it starts to swell, it pops, it clicks, and now they're losing it on time with their friends. That to me would be a really great indication to do a regenerative injection because you're active, it's relatively mild, we can get you usually some pretty good results. And usually, you know, if people have already had a surgery in the area, sometimes that makes things a little bit more complicated. Again, doesn't mean we can't work on it, but sometimes we have to be a little bit more flexible with our expectations simply because after that tissue has been altered at the hands of a surgeon, or maybe you have something artificial in there, like a pin or something, it really just does kind of limit what the body's capabilities are for renewal and regeneration. And, you know, I always like to say, if you can try something regenerative before you go the surgery route, please do. Yeah. Surgery will always be an option, but a lot of times we can't come back after surgery. Yeah. Oh, that makes so much sense. Um, I had a, a family member that needed a hip replacement and got stem cells first and actually did really, so this was a left hip. We thought absolutely needed surgery. Left hip's doing fine. Now his right hip needs surgery, but it was like this really cool thing because he staved out that surgery procedure on the left hip. And absolutely, as far as what I saw in the MRI, he probably needed a replacement and maybe still will, but it definitely bought some time. And that was neat for me to see too, because I thought a hip is a hip is a hip if it's, there's no joint left. Right. But I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. Um, yeah. so really cool. What, um, would you say whether it's prolo and I know this might differ between the procedure, but say prolotherapy versus PRP versus stem cell. I know there's lots of, uh, stipulations on not using anti-inflammatories around the time frame. Do you want to give just a little bit of a primer on what the patient might do before the procedure and after for the different ones? Generally speaking, I like patients to go on as anti-inflammatory of a diet as possible, because my goal is to not have excess inflammation coming in because the nature of the type of injections that we're doing, we're going to cause inflammation. And people may be thinking, oh my gosh, isn't inflammation bad? I don't think so. I think that inflammation that is uncontrolled and not leading to an end result can be bad, which we see in, of course, in autoimmune patients and people who have things like chronic inflammatory response syndrome. But in the context of actually healing a joint, you want purposeful inflammation, you want controlled inflammation, and you want inflammation that's going to progress down the healing cycle to that proliferation level, to that remodeling level, so that we can actually get that new tissue. Like in that hip, for example, he, the allowing of the time to heal 
probably cause some of that new cartilage to grow. And as long as there's even a sliver, like as long as there's something for whatever you're using to work on, we can get that new growth. The body is always in a state of healing, unless of course you're dead. But as long as you are alive, the body's always trying to heal, always trying to correct. And sometimes we just need to give it the right instructions and the right tools. Oh, fantastic. Can you share maybe a case or two of some of the really neat things you've seen or experienced with whatever therapy that you want to talk about? Oh my gosh. So I do a lot of low backs. Uh, there's a condition out there called arachnoiditis and it has nothing to do with spiders, but it has to do with damage that happens at the spinal cord lev level, usually as the, after the result of some sort of procedure that didn't quite go as expected. Uh, a common thing, a common cause of this is actually epidurals. So people going in for epidurals for chronic pain, women going in for epidurals for childbirth. And there's something that happens to that spinal canal and the tissues that surround it to the point where now some of the nerves that are exiting the spine actually start to clump together. And there's this really intense chronic pain picture that starts to develop. A lot of the patients, they start to get really severe neuropathy. In addition to the low back pain, some people have to get pain pumps installed. They become dep dependent on pain medications. They lose bowel function, bladder function, sexual function. It's just a terribly, uh, it's, it's one of the most terrible illnesses out there. One of the most severe low back situations ever. And I have had the pleasure of working with a number of these patients to the point where we have gotten people out of wheelchairs. We've gotten people off of pain pumps and we have actually seen MRI changes over time that show it has healed to the point where there's no more cord tethering. There's no more spinal stenosis. There's no more facet arthrosis. Uh, it just really, really significant improvements. I have one patient in particular, and we did his follow up. And I have to laugh because it, his initial visit, he was like, I just want to walk around the block. I can't walk. I can't do anything. I just want to take a walk around the block. He was mad at his follow up that he was only walking three miles. Oh, wow. I'm like, come on, we need to have a talk here because that's incredible. And of course, after we went over everything, he's like, yeah, I'm like, people in your situation, they just they don't get better. And the fact is, we took you from not walking to walking. And I know it's not where, you know, as much as you want to be walking, but man, three miles after that sort of situation is, you know, nothing to nothing to frown about. And, you know, we see stuff like that all the time where people just get a level of healing that they that no one told them was possible, that they didn't believe was possible. And it just kind of defies what the expectations are in the current medical model. I uh, love that. Um, now, you maybe already answered this, but one thought that I've had before is I'll, you know, do a procedure or, or give a patient a protocol. And sometimes in my mind, I'm like, wow, this is going to be hard. I don't know if they'll get better, but I don't necessarily tell them that. And then they come back and they're better. And I'm like, wow, even for me, I'm in disbelief. Like, I can't believe that just happened. Can you think of any situations, maybe some of the ones you just said, but anything else about the situations where you thought, even with all that, you know, you're like, oh, this is going to be a hard case. And then you saw them turn around. All on, I wouldn't say all the time, but you know, people sometimes find their way to stem cell therapy because they've exhausted everything. They have tried all the medications. They might've had the surgeries. They've done all the alternative stuff. They've maybe done the frog poison and the ayahuasca. Like they have run the gamut of things that they have tried. And finally, you know, the stem cells is, is their last choice. I had this one, this one lady and I shouldn't lady. She, she was a young lady, very young, early twenties, whole life ahead of her one of the most severe cases of lichen sclerosis that I've ever seen, which is an autoimmune disorder um, people not, might not be aware of, but you basically end up developing plaques on your most intimate regions, end up with a lot of pain. And, you know, she's about to start her life. She's engaged. And she was, she had tried everything, every round of antibiotics. She had done stem cells pr two previous times with another practitioner who had a slightly different approach than I did. And, uh, she she's so sweet. She literally said, you saved my life. And we got her better. She was able to go um, go on to getting married, doing, you know, going back to her life. And we kind of put that into remission. And people will tell you, you know, you can't put autoimmune disorders into remission. But I've seen in time and time again that we can. Oh, I love that. I, I love talking about reversible autoimmunity, just like you, because it's like blows people's mind, my history with cancer and then Crohn's. And I was told it's incurable. You're going to have this lifelong. There's nothing we can do. You'll probably have part of your colon removed. All that was not true. I'm completely free of Crohn's disease 20 years later. No signs or symptoms of that. I might have all of my bowel <laughs> normal. And it's just the, again, that's very different from your case, but in the sense of the fact that things that we consider irreversible. And I love that you and I are sharing because that's where I started the conversation is so often, even as a doctor who believes in miracles, I'd be like, oh, this is a tough case. And then they'll come back and like, it won't better. I'm like, really? <laughs> I love that. Yes. I love and that. I love those. I love those so much. And it's, it's just a testament to, I have, had a, a teacher one time and 
they said, what was the line? There's no such thing as an incurable disease, but there are incurable patients. And so I guess the, the reverse, you know, it, the reverse can be true for that too, but it just is a testament to the power of the right therapy at the right time in the right patient. And of course the mindset of somebody wanting to heal. Uh, I think that's a really big component too, that a lot of people don't pay attention to is you got to be ready for it. You do. Right. I love that. And, and believe what else is possible. Cause that's for me with Crohn's. I'm like, wait, this doesn't make sense. I, I think I can fix this. And it took some time, but it did happen. Um, what do you see as a landscape? I think things keep changing pretty rapidly in stem cells and peptides and exosomes. We're losing some of the things that we've used forever, but you're in the trenches working. What do you see as the pros and cons of what's happening as far as your access to these things or maybe what's changing for the better? Give us kind of both sides of the coin. So the good news is that people really are trying to keep these things accessible to patients as much as they can. And that's, I think, really all we can do. You know, there's the three letter agencies that are trying to remove things for no good reason, except they want to get their hands in it so that they can make money. So on the stem cell side, I'll give you an example. They tried to say that if I were to say, take your stem cells out from your own fat tissue, process them, and then give them back to you, that now what I've done is I've created a drug. And now I'm drug manufacturing, which means I need to be overseen by the pharmaceutical industry and that that process then needs to be sold back to you to the tune of about half a million dollars for you to get your own now drug approved stem cells, which is insane, right? So we know that your cells or your body is neither a food nor a drug. So it shouldn't be, you know, monitored by the organization that promotes foods and drugs. Right. But they try, they really try to say that that is. And, you know, there was a, a case not too long ago with a group out of California and they were fighting the government on this and they won and because of the premise that your body your tissues your cells they're not drugs which of course we all know that but there just had to be this case so since that ruling it's been a lot more optimistic in the field as far as okay we may be able to get some of this stuff back because ultimately the drug manufacturing aspect of it and why stem cells will likely never fall under that is that there's no ability to standardize human tissue you can't replicated at mass. You can't, you know, there's just, there's no way. So we may be safe in that regard. Um, the other side to it too, is some people will start to say, well, when will this be covered by insurance? And that I don't know. I don't play a lot in the insurance industry. And the tricky thing with that becomes, well, at what standard then would insurance cover it? And do we really want this procedure only available to people at the you know, permission of somebody's insurance company when they could still benefit from it regardless. And what will they have to try? What will they have to fail? How long will they have to wait? And I like that it's currently accessible right now to pretty much, you know, anybody who might want it. On the peptide side of things, that's it. It's kind of heartbreaking because the FDA did try taking a bunch of those away from us as well. We can still get a good amount and there's still a lot that we can do. In general, I like to think of peptides as like a cherry on top of an already great system. Yeah. So you've already got everything else dialed in. So yes, they can absolutely optimize things, but I don't think that they're going to be, you know, a, a general root cause thing for most people. So while it's a loss, it's not something that is, I think, really going to be super damaging long-term. And of course, there's a lot of companies that are trying to come up with alternatives to possibly do similar things or even better things. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree more. I mean, what happened was a shift of taking away injectables and now there's oral peptides, which actually some of them are quite effective. We actually carry some in our clinic and, and they, I've been having great results with that, even though we don't have access to all the injectables we used to. So yes, to be continued on all of this, but I know you and I, and anyone in this realm is really trying to be advocates for the therapies that really help our patients um, because it's not about profit. It's about, you know, helping patients, so I love that. <laughs> love, love, love that. Um, anything you see on the horizon as future things that maybe aren't ready for consumers yet, but you see as potential opportunities? So there's a lot of research happening in the gene editing space. And I don't know how much you, you've dove into that, but there's a couple companies now where you can go offshore and get a gene therapy to lengthen your telomeres, to help with um, muscle mass increase. Uh, there's there's quite a few. So I think there's even one for, oh gosh, I'm blanking on it, but there's, there's multiple ones out there. And I think that that's going to be an interesting phenomenon to see how that shifts and it ever does become part of the mainstream. And if the pricing on that does ever come down, because from what I understand, and you know, don't quote me on this, but and a treatment on those ranges in the tens of thousands, if not a hundred thousand dollars to do something like that. But 
you know, people get curious, people want to know if they're safe, if they're effective. And I think we're still in the early stages of that. Uh, but I think that might be something that's on the horizon. Yeah. And what I'm sure you have seen as well is some of these things as they come, they're exponential, like the, the, the uh, rate at which they're coming to market is much quicker than it used to be. Like things are exponentially increasing. So stay tuned because who knows in a couple of years, we might be way further ahead than we ever thought in some of these regenerative therapies. Um, amazing. Well, I have really enjoyed hearing more about all the stuff that you're doing. If people want to find out more about you, your practice, where can they go? Yeah, so I'm most active on Instagram. You can find me there just at Dr. Solt, D-R-S-O-L-T. And website is www.stemcelltherapypro.com. That's going to be the best way for anybody to book a call, learn about if we can help you and just kind of see our offerings and our services. Fantastic. And I'm assuming you're still taking clients and patients and I am. We usually book out about a month, but yet yeah, definitely still accepting new clients. Fantastic. So if you're driving anywhere, you're listening, you will have this in the show notes. So don't stop the car to take notes. We'll make sure you have everything you need. Um, thanks so much, Dr. Self, for joining us. This has been a really enlightening conversation. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. And thank you guys for joining us for another episode of Resiliency Radio. I hope you enjoyed the show. Stay tuned for new episodes coming out every Wednesday. Um, and you can find this anywhere you watch, listen, or uh, are aware of podcasts. Please be sure and leave us a review, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and thank you again for joining us.